DVD will be coming from. So, what are the objectives of the fire system? Um, my first, we want to systematically, automatically identify the networks that act maliciously. Um, what we also want to do, this is the second goal of the fire system, um, we want to notify legitimate networks that they host malicious activity. Because often, um, like uh, legitimate ISPs don't even know that they host malicious activity because they have so many clients, they have so many servers, they just cannot find all the activity that, I that exists on their network. So the ultimate goal would be to assist legitimate ISPs to de-peer uh, rogue networks. Well, this is hard to do. However, um, examples have shown that by exposing those networks to the media, this is possible. I will have an example or some examples later on. Um, well, and in general, we want to make the internet a safer place. So if we make it difficult for the cyber criminals to find safe havens for their illicit activities, so if we force them to move from server to server because they get shut down, if we move to force them from country to country, like in the case of the Russian business network where the whole network had to move to China, then we can make the life of the criminals harder. And that's what we want to achieve. So what are the challenges? Um, in this, uh, for the system. Well, first we have to identify malicious networks. Um, how do we identify malicious content? Um, Olivier already told us um, we have a lot of sensors in place. I will show later um, what sensors exactly we use for fire. Um, and the question is, however, when do we consider a host malicious? Um, a lot of malicious um, malicious stuff is hosted on compromised servers. And we are not interested in compromised servers. Those are just poor guys who get the server hacked and then they serve, let's say, drive-by downloads. And this has nothing to do with a real rogue network. So we have to find a way to filter out those compromised servers. So how do we do this? Um, well, the main difference is the longevity of the, con uh, of the online time of the content. So if we see that content, malicious content, is hosted for a prolonged period of time, then we can assume, with using some heuristics, that this is probably a malicious host or a host in a malicious network. Um, one last point, how do we account for size? Um, we have really large ISPs and hosting providers, and they have a lot of malicious activity. They have a lot of servers that are usually not that well administered, so they get hacked, they serve malicious binaries, whatever, and um, the absolute numbers are high. However, those are not the really bad guys. They are good guys that try to clean their servers, but they cannot cope up with the work. So we also have to filter out that. So how does our system work? Um, well, first, we monitor malicious activities. We have classified malicious activities um, here in these four points. Um, first, we monitor botnet command and control servers. Uh, we monitor phishing servers. We monitor drive-by download servers. And we monitor spam servers. Once we have found a server that conducts one of those illicit activities, we uh, capture the network traffic, and we replay it to the server. And we look how long the server responds. So Usually, after some time, the server gets cleaned up, and we can, we can notice this. So basically, we cannot download the virus bi uh, binary anymore. Then we say, OK, now the server is offline. And thus, this allows us to determine the uptime of malicious servers. Um, once we have this, we aggregate the malicious IP addresses at an autonomous system level. So uh, what is an autonomous system? I think we all know this. Um, I put the definition up there, but it's just a network on the internet. It's a bunch of computers controlled by a single entity. Um, so what we, what we can do is, once we have identified um, the IP of a server that acts maliciously, we resolve the IP address to his uh, to its autonomous system number. And what we do is we compute a maliciousness score for the autonomous system number. Um, I will show you how this works. Um, we have been monitoring um, those threats since August 2008, so 
almost two years. Okay, now for some details. Um, first, the data collection. Well, we need what in the CNC servers. What we have is the Anubis sandbox. I don't know if you or know Anubis. Um, this is a sandboxing system that can analyze malicious code. So basically, you go to the web interface, you upload the virus that you have found somewhere on your computer, and it tells you, okay, this is this is malicious because it does that, 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 that. So what we do is we look at the network traffic, and whenever a bot connects to some controlling uh, command and control server. Um, we, of course, log the IP address of this command and control server. Um, what we're also looking at are drive-by download hosting providers. So what we first do is we have a client honeypot, Capture HPC. Um, this works uh, more or less, you have a virtual machine with a browser running automatically that serves to some URLs, and sooner or later this browser gets exploited. Um, in that case, what usually happens is that uh, binary is downloaded from somewhere. The interesting thing is the binary is usually downloaded from somewhere else. So it's not from the server, from the web server that got hacked and had an SQL injection or whatever that exploits your browser, but it's uh, downloaded from a server in the background. And we are interested in that server in the background because those servers are usually um, located in the malicious networks. So we get those IPs. Um, also, we have uh, WebPowet which is a website uh, analysis system. So basically you can um, post URLs to WebAWET, isaacclip.org, and you get a complete um, analysis what this website does, if there is shell code somewhere hidden in JavaScript, and it says, okay, this website tries to download the binary from that server, and again, we get the server in the background and we feed it into Fire. Um, Finally, we have uh, fishtank.com. We get a lot of uh, phishing sites from fishtank. Um, however, the data from fishtank is not really accurate for our purposes. Um, why is that? Because we have to do a lot of filtering for compromised servers, for fast flux toasts. So we do a lot of uh, post-processing for fishtank, and then we find some sites that really stay on for a long time um, and we add the IPs of those servers to Fire. Um, I had one data source um, on the slide before that was uh, spamming servers. Spamming servers are not used for Fire right now. Um, any ideas why this could be? No. Um, of course, spamming is usually done by bots. So we have um, owned user machines in some legitimate ISP ranges, and the command and control server, of course, is located in a malicious network and control, uh, controls those machines, but the spam actually gets sent out from legitimate IP ranges, so we cannot use this for uh, our analysis. What's interesting here is that we made a um, correlation analysis, and if a network shows one of those three um, uh, malicious, malicious activities. So if you have a, a command control server in, in a network, then you usually have a very high probability to find also the other two malicious activities. So those three are highly correlated. For spam, this is completely not true. That's why we left it out. So once we do this, we make a, a data analysis. So first, we look at the longevity of the malicious IP addresses. Um, as I told you before, the vast majority of malicious content is taken down within a few uh, days, usually. Um, however, some malicious content stays on for a very long time. In this example, put for more than, for more than a year. Um, what we see here is the drop-off for botnets and phishing servers. So we see a lot of servers for, with an uptime of only one, two, three, four days, and that's it. However, we have a very, very long tail where a lot of servers are located in malicious networks and they stay online for months and more. So what we just need to do, just need to do, <laughs> easier said than done, um, we have to cut off the very left part of this graph. Um, right now we use the thresholds of, I think, five days and everything that stays on longer than five days is probably in a malicious network. Um, for drive-by downloads, the situation is different. 
we have a drop off in the uh, in the time on the online time of the IPs. However, it's not as deep as for phishing and for uh, uh, botnets. So why is this? Um, I told you before, setting up a drive-by download requires a lot of know-how. So setting up a phishing page is something that everyone can do. Everyone can copy a website and put it on his own server, and also everyone can uh, create, for example, an IRC channel that is used for command and control uh, purposes of bots. You can just join the channel and it's there. So this, on the other hand, needs a lot of know-how. You need to uh, be able to exploit the browser. You need to hack websites that distribute your exploit. And in the very end, you need the uh, download server in the background. In that case, um, the criminals usually uh, make sure that the server is really online, that it's available. And that's you see a lot of bulletproof hosting here. And that's why we take all the IPs that we find from that data source directly into account. So, um, okay, this is the formula that we use for uh, computing a uh, mass score for an autonom autonomous system. It's the only formula I have, I promise. Um, the interesting thing is not the sum on the right, which is just, uh, it just takes all the IPs from the three data sources that I present. However, there is the scaling factor for network size. Um, network size is important, but it's hard to determine the size of a network. So what we have here is an estimation. It's the size that the network um, announces to the outside. In many cases, we know that it's not true because sometimes networks um, announce a really huge range but only have a couple of machines online. And the opposite is also true when um, net is used and the network size to the outside is very small, but in reality, there are a lot of hosts behind the net. So it's an estimation, but it works quite well. So now what we've done, we have processed a lot of networks um, with our method, and this is one of the results. Um, this is a result from summer 2009. Um, I wasn't too lazy to update the slides, but um, the actual the numbers from this summer are really boring. They're just large ISPs, so this one gives m much more information. So what do we have here? Um, first place, IPNAP. Um, they are definitely, uh, they were definitely the leader in IRC-based botnets. They are still. Um, we have um, in place six the Leonidovich network. This was a drive-by download campaign. Um, we have the Petersburg Internet network. This was SUS botnet hosting. We have the Global Net Access. They have, uh, they've been the leaders in phishing uh, pages. So this looks really nice. We have the top 10 networks by fire. So what we want to do now is um, we want to know, is this correct? The problem is there is no ground truth. We cannot say that these are really the malicious networks. We cannot just, I don't know, mail their admin and ask, hey, are you the Russian business dudes? We cannot do this. So what we did is we looked at what others say. So that's why we have this uh, four columns at the right. Uh, well, IPNAP, for example, is number one in Shadow Server, another uh, monitoring system. Then we have the Petersburg Internet Network, which is um, found by, which was found by Seuss Tracker, in sixth place. Um, one interesting thing is maybe the Novikov Alexander Leonidovich Network, because none of the other automated systems um, found it at that time, so they had no idea about this network. However, there were blocks. This is the very rightmost column. Um, those blogs already uh, wrote about the uh, Leonidovich network, and they said, hey, look at this network. There's something going on. They are purely malicious. And Fire already found this. The other guys did not. So this is pretty impressive for an automated system. Um, so what we also do, we did it the other way around. So we looked at Shadow Server and compared it with the Fire rank. So in the in the rank one, we agree. This is IPNAP, they are malicious, perfect. However, in rank two, uh, for Shadow Server, this is Access for All. And Access for All definitely has a lot of malicious activity. However, the main problem is not that they are malicious, but that this is a really huge network. So that's why Fire degrades it to 